the legalist says, you should not and you should. That's what a legalist, that's how we motivate as a legalist. You should not and you should, like you should not sin, you should do this, okay? The gospel says you need not do that, but you need. You, you need not do that, but you need. So the legalist would say, you need to get on mission. The gospel says, well, you needn't get on mission. You're already loved in acceptance. But you need to live a life fulfilling God's purposes on mission because that's how you're going to come to know him. That's how God's going to shape and mold you more into Christ. Just sitting in a classroom is not going to get that done. So you don't need to be on mission to, to please him. You already have that in Christ. But you need to be on his mission because that's how he's going to conform you. Welcome to the Everyday Disciple Podcast, where you'll learn how to live with greater intentionality and an integrated faith that naturally fits into every area of life. In other words, discipleship as a lifestyle. This is the stuff your parents, pastors, and seminary professors probably forgot to tell you. And now, here's your host, Caesar Kalinowski. All right, here we are. Hope you're having a good week. We've just come through one of the hottest weeks on record. I think it maybe broke all the records between Seattle and Portland. I mentioned that last time we were together, we were getting into some stuff. Wow, it was really, really hot. But I'll tell you what, we're going to have a bumper crop of vegetables and different things in our garden. The fruits and the veggies are all loving this hot weather. Tina's been working so hard in her garden, and we've had a water double down on the watering program, obviously with the heat. We got some new fruit trees that also are loving this, and I'm excited for it. It's, uh, it's not a problem. I'd like to complain about warm weather. We don't get that many months of it here. Let me uh, read a couple reviews that have come in on the podcast. I love these. I try to read these when they come in, if we have time. This one is from Redina. It says, love your podcast. Five stars. Thank you. It says, a friend shared your podcast back in May, and within a couple of weeks, I was caught up with all the episodes. Big fan of the idea of gospel fluency. Wow, we're going to talk about that today. You introduced me to as well as the concept of helping people move from unbelief to belief in every area of life. Yeah, we sure say that a lot. A burden to bring people to Jesus has been lifted off. I find your weekly podcast relevant and practical, and I've applied many of the ideas shared in my daily walk with family, friends, workers, coworkers, and all that. I look forward to every episode. Thank you so much. That is really kind and sweet of you. Thanks for putting that review out there. It helps encourage other people. Here's another one that came in from Steeny. Steeny, ha. Huh? says, love it, also loving it, five stars. This is a challenging thing in all the right ways. It's theologically deep and sound while being surprisingly practical. We sure try. <laughs> I'm inspired all the time. Thanks for that, too. And again, that encourages others as they're searching around through podcast worlds. These ones came in through the Apple podcast application tool thing, uh, but you can leave a review anywhere you want if you're podcast listening network supports that, but you can certainly subscribe and that way you don't miss any episodes. So if I can just ask you to do that, pay it forward, bless us by subscribing so you don't miss episodes. Sharing this with others takes like seconds to share in your app to other people. Hey, this has really been good. Or you can go to the Facebook group and share out the episodes there or whatever. There's all kinds of places you can listen to these days. We've put them all on a little easy to use page. You can go to everydaydisciple.com forward slash subscribe. And would you do that for us? Would you pay it forward and bless us by helping other people find the podcast by subscribing and sharing and leaving reviews and stuff like that? And before I get going, if you're interested in learning a full framework for discipleship and mission, the things we're talking about on the Everyday Disciple podcast where discipleship becomes a lifestyle that naturally grows out of your family's rhythms and how you live and it flows out of a gospel fluency and gospel motivation into everyday life. We'd love to help you with that. Tina and I do coaching as couple for couples, and we have some slots that open up now and then for coaching. There's not a lot because we give so much of our time and access to people in the coaching calls, but we would love to set up a short Zoom call to get to know you better and answer any questions you have if you're interested in just finding out more. You can go to everydaydisciple.com forward slash coaching 
and there'll be more information there and a little form, real short little thing you can fill out. And we'll hop on a Zoom call and get to know each other and tell you a little bit about what we're doing with the coaching. <laughs> all right. So with all the changes we're facing as Christians and as the church, things are really different this year. In the last 18 months, it's all really changed. We have new church and family rhythms of ministry, or we're trying to, or we're trying new things. We're trying to help our folks get out there and be the church a whole lot more. I'm not saying our meaning just us, but I know the church capital C really is. And it keeps coming up. How do we stay motivated and motivate others to desire to live a lifestyle of discipleship and mission beyond a weekly meeting. Even if that's changed or sometimes we do it live and now people can tune in so we're not seeing as many people because they're just tuning in on the stream, on the internet, or at least we think they are. But you know how that goes because everything that's beyond like a second or three seconds counts as a stream, as a watch. And you're like, wow, look at all the people watching. Mm, Not necessarily. So as we're moving people out to be the church in micro churches, in homes, in small groups, in missional communities that are a part of our larger churches, family life together, how do we rightly motivate people? I can remember when we first started living in and multiplying missional communities, making disciples that way, we weren't always the best at motivating our people with the gospel. A lot of our quote unquote encouragements, if you will, had a pretty big dose of, well, you should be doing this, right? This is what the Bible teaches or supposed to, we're supposed to live this way, supposed to do this or that. We threw way too much of that in. And eventually, even though we were having fun and things were growing, it started to feel like law and people didn't love it. They didn't want this life. So how do we rightly motivate people? Starting with ourselves, to want to live this life that Jesus died to give us. Well, I want to share a talk that I gave a few years back when I was part of the leadership of Soma Communities. And my buddy Heath and I, who was part of the Life School podcast, we've shared parts of this talk before previously back years ago uh, when the podcast was called Life School. And this is a training I was giving primarily to a large room of church planners. However, as you'll hear, this applies to all of us, especially today within our changing culture and church rhythms. So what I'm going to cover in this part of this talk is how maybe our American dream life may be a smokescreen for not living on mission. It might be a convenient excuse for not living on mission and why what you believe in your head will change what you believe in your heart. That's how it flows, head, heart, then into our life, our hands. We're also going to talk about how the gospel changes all of our motivations and our affections, even maybe where we live. Okay, so take a listen. I'll be back at the end with the big three for today and a new segment of something to think about. Here we go. What we're finding is, is that to consistently motivate people for the mission, that just using the stick of should or why wouldn't you or you could or shame or whatever is not a good long-term motivator. It really, there needs to be a gospel-centered motivation to helping our people either get on mission or even really stay on mission. Because, you know, Scripture talks about the beast, the world system. It is pushing against this. It's pushing against us. It is trying, it is tearing down and throwing up lots of roadblocks that we've gotten used to or that we're weary of or that we've even erected sometimes as the church. And, and we, need, we do need to be motivated. I, I need consistent motivation. And so I want to talk a little about how do, we, how do we move to gospel motivation with our people, not just more head knowledge or not just more classwork or not just a better small group or missional community structure, but how are we going to motivate them in the everyday? I think what I want to suggest is it's going to start with what you love. You have to motivate what you love, what they love, what you love. I'm not sure if it was Twain or who it was that said, if you wanna, if you wanna teach somebody how to build a boat, first give them a love for the sea. Because if they love the sea, they will look out there and go like, I have to figure out how to build a boat. <laughs> I will figure out how to build a boat. If, if, our folks, if our folks are not in love with God and not in love with Christ, deeply and are not loving the things that he loves and died for, 
they really will not be that motivated to be out making disciples to make disciples. They won't be motivated for the mission. That's the mission, right? Now, we, we do a heart check with that because I'll be honest with you, there again, I'm pretty pragmatic. And often I am way more focused on tightening up this broken system in Soma or getting this new thing launched or getting these set of missional communities shored up over here or getting a key leader plugged in over there. And I lose my first love. I lose the love of Christ. And that's for people who were created in his image to show the world what he's like who aren't or not to the degree that God intends. And they need Christ and they need the power of the gospel to transform them and send them out on that same same trajectory. What you love is going to be the, it's going to be a huge primary motivator. So if, if, if you see, and I know when we ever feel like the temperature is turned down and we're not seeing a lot of conversions, we're not seeing people start to walk in the ways of Christ, we ask ourselves, how are we doing? How's our love temperature? Are we motivating our people to really love God and love Christ and love what he died for? I, I love the story in Scripture with Abraham and Isaac, right? If you know the story of Abraham, you've got, uh, you've got a descendant of a bunch of moon worshipers who's out doing what he's doing. If you know the full story of Abraham, he's not that great of a guy. He's kind of a big fat liar. At one point, he pimps out his wife on a journey to save his own neck, right? And, but God chooses him. Like grace upon grace, God reaches out and chooses this guy and makes the amazing covenant with him to make him famous throughout all of history and make him into a great nation and that he would bless the whole world through this guy and his family. And it starts with a son. It starts with Isaac. And, and as we tell the story of God and as we form people in story and we go to the next story and we look at like, okay, you won't even believe what happens next. God calls Abraham to take Isaac up onto a mountain and sacrifice him. And if you're a dad or your mom, and you just that story is horrifying. I, I'm an only son. I only have a, one son, two daughters. And that story wrecks me every time. But that's what Abraham does. And in that story, God, when he stops Abraham's hand, coming down with the knife, you can just see it in slow-mo, just coming down to sacrifice his son, already tied up on the wood. God says, stop, do not harm your son. Now I know, now I know you love me the most. You did not withhold from me the thing you loved the most in, the, in this world. In other words, you, were, you loved me more, God says. Like, wow. Like, really? You, Abraham loved God more than that first son that was the hinge pin for the whole nation and then the, the blessing ultimately we know now in Christ being real God says, now I know you love me more. You did not withhold even this from me. And let me ask you, what do you love the most in your life? Be honest. What do you love the most? Do you love your status as a pastor, elder, Sunday school leader, dad, mom? Do you love your current house? Like, I really love my house, man. I can remember back in Chicago when God moved us to Tacoma. I can remember, it was probably a year and a half before he even moved us. He was preparing my heart, my wife's heart for moving to plant. We had it made back there. And we had the nicest house like anybody in our family had ever had. Like we'd arrived maybe. Of course we were working for a mega church and churches pay well. You know? so, and I remember the spirit of God saying to me, what if I call you to sell this house? And I remember weeping because in, in my heart I was like, I don't want to sell this house. This is an awesome freaking house. Do you love your kids more than you love God? How many of your folks love their kids more than they love the mission that Christ died to send us on? It's evident. You can see it. You can see the little idols that are running around the house and how they're treated by the parents in all the soccer gangs and the private school. And I'm not against any of this, okay, but it's just how you, where your heart lands on it. 
And they got to be at every camp and they got to be at summer camp for both soccer and for band and they got to be at this and that and this and they got to have this for their education and that. Or, or like we just had a couple in our community recently talking again about their kids, the pressure they put on their kids to do well and excel so they could get into the right university. And then once they got to the right universities, the pressure that they, loving Christian parents that they were, were putting on their kids, they loved their kids and the way their kids made them appear in their parenting more than they loved God and the mission. God says to Abraham, now I know you love me more. We're going to have to call idols idols. And in, 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 in the suburbs, it's maybe, I don't know, it's the same everywhere. It's maybe even worse here. But people love them, them houses. And they love them cars and them flat screens and those kids and those soccer games and their big church buildings. And go down the list. And none of it's bad until it takes our heart. Until those good things become the ultimate thing, like Tim Keller says. None of that's bad. But we know, heart of hearts, we know ourselves and we know lots of our people love that stuff way more than they love the mission. Because all, you, all you'd have to do is open up their day, their day timers or open up their calendars and you'd know. Look at, their, look at the ledger of how they spend their money. Look at how you spend yours. You'll know what you love the most. We're going to have to call idols idols and we're going to have to paint the gospel of God and Christ and all that he is and is doing over and over and, and, and we're just going to have to see Jesus get beautiful and make much of him over and over so that people will begin to go like, I can't believe I spent X amount of years chasing after the American nightmare of stuff and more when I could have, been, I could have, I could have had this role in the kingdom of God. I could, sweeping out the king, the corner of this kingdom is more than I deserve. Lord, whatever you'd have for me. What you love the most. Now there's two sides of that coin in that story. I, I, that's why I love this story. He, also, he says that, God says that to Abraham, but then he goes on to say, now I know that you fear me. <laughs> what you love the most, but now I know that you fear me. Well, we know that the fear of the Lord is not this trembling fear, in Christ, it's, it's, it's reverence, it's awe, it's the most glory, it's the most weighty thing in our life is, is God. When God says, now I know you fear me, he's, he, he's telling Abraham, I know where your heart's at. See, whatever you fear the most will, have the, will be the governing power of your life. If you fear your parents' approval or not getting it because you're out planting church and it's, you're not running that money that big, that's our term in 829, how many are you running on Sunday? And if you fear approval for how many you're running or your supporters back home or wherever and you don't know how to tell them that you're actually living life on mission with people and not that many show up on Sunday, but all week long people are coming to know Jesus and what he's like and put their faith and hope and trust in him, if you fear that the most, then you won't. See, you'll, you'll go back to counting the three Bs, butts, budgets, and buildings, you know? If you fear most losing your position in the church because you know if you go after the idols, out you go. If you fear your wife's approval, if you fear your husband's approval, now I know that you fear me. Whatever you fear the most will be the governing power of your life. I, w I don't know if it's even right to think this. I'd like to fear the most that I'm going to stand before the throne someday. And you know when it says in Scripture, Jesus says, you can do everything you've seen me do and even greater things. Like what are the greater things, Jesus? You really rocked it when you were here. I'm hoping to avoid that cross part of your life. But pretty much everything before and after looks really good to me. And powerful. Jesus says you get to do all of that and even more greater things. I, I don't want to stand there and go like, oh, I could have done that? What, what she just said? I could have done, I would have done that. I, I could have made disciples in that nation. I mean, you would have changed a whole city through our family if we'd have lived this, believe that? I, I mean, I don't know if that's even good theology. <laughs> I want to fear the most that I actually that God is glorious and he's the one I, who I have his approval and so therefore that's the motivator of my life. Oh, I'm accepted, I'm good. If we never make another disciple, 
just as good. If our church never gets beyond 20 people, I'm just as accepted. We're going to keep on trying to make disciples here. What do you fear the most? Next thing is you motivate people in what they love. Okay, what they love. The next thing is what you believe. And we break belief down this way. Belief, we believe, what do you believe in your head? What do you believe in your heart? And what do you believe with your hands? It's old school, head, heart, hands. It's part of making disciples. It's gotta be holistic. We'll talk about that in that last session. So what they believe is gonna be a constant motivator for them. What do they believe? Let's start with what you believe in your head. Do your folks, do you know, do your people know, are they motivated by a belief in their head of the power and the purpose of the gospel? Do they know that the gospel is powerful to save? They've saved them from the penalty. It's saving them right now, sanctifying them, and it's gonna save them from all the presence of sin. Do they know that? Do they know they have a huge purpose for their life and there's no plan B? I'm not going to teach the whole thing again, but do your people know a really big, fully orbed power and purpose of the gospel? They need to, or they'll think it's all about them, or they'll flip to the other side and they'll just get busy without power and they'll hate their life. And the world watches that, by the way, that busy restorative life of doing lots of church stuff and missional looking stuff without a power that's beyond us. The world watches that and goes, no, thanks. I already have that without the guilt. I'm already working my guts out for I don't know what. Without the guilt, you're doing it with a lot of shame and guilt. I'll just keep what I got, okay? So what they believe in their head. Do they believe the gospel, okay? Do they believe their identity in Christ? We form our communities around this in everything we do over and over from day one to day when Jesus gets back, their identity in Christ. Who you are will lead to what you do. If you want to motivate people out on the mission of making disciples who make disciples with all of their life, they're going to actually have to believe they've become a new creation in Christ. Now how we articulate it, how God has led us to articulate it, is there's four, sort of four filters we say this is our identity family of God we're missionaries we're family we're missionaries we're servants we're learners and that's the word we use for disciple because in our context disciple carried with it some kind of weird kind of cultic leftover residual in Tacoma so we, we say learner a person who's taking responsibility for their own learning and the learning of others Okay, so we, we, this rolls out of our mouth all day, every day. We're a family of missionary servants. That's who we are, who are and are making disciples. We're a family of missionary servants who are making disciples. Now where we get that, just in case you want to know, it's, it comes from this thing called the Trinity. Okay, if we all have the same father church, we're sons and daughters of the same dad, what does that make us? Family. If, if, if the son is our king, he's Lord over all. It's his kingdom, his church. That makes us his servants. The two basic requirements for a kingdom to exist. A king, servants. And then who in the Trinity, Father, Son, who is the sending agent of Christ? Who sent Christ? And now who is the sending agent of the church? The Spirit. See, if we have the Holy Spirit, we are missionary people. We are. We're a family of missionary servants if we're, if we're in Christ. That's why when you baptize people, did you ever wonder why they baptized people into the name of, that's an identity statement, the, baptizing them, making disciples, baptizing them into the name of the Father so they know they're my family, that they're a family, they're a chosen family, a set-apart family. In the Son, they're to be servants because he's the king and he actually came as a servant. And the Holy Spirit. Go, therefore, and make. See, when you baptize people, that's what you're doing, is you're baptizing them into a new identity. They come up out of the water new, as it were. That's what it means to be a disciple. Do your people believe their identity? See, if you are a missionary, then you go and you seek, you know? If you're a family, you live a certain way. People say, like, oh, how do you guys in Soma live this way? And your, your lives are sort of all intertwined and you're sharing your stuff and you're doing this and you're doing that. Well, 
what is, what is a good family? If we're family, what does life look like? Does it look like we sit in silence once a week for an hour and a half in rows? Does it look like, no, on top of that, we get together and study that same message over some pie once a week, but I don't really have any other connection to you all week? That would be a crappy family. See, our identity, it answers it, answers it all. What would a family of missionary servants who are disciples and are making disciples, what would they look like? You're going to have to motivate your people. What do they know? What do they know in their head? And do they know then that the mission is to make disciples? I, I swear, I think we have done a really good job. I know I did for years. That I think what we taught people, like what, the, you know, what they knew in their head the mission was, was come to church on Sunday. Get people to church on Sunday. So the professional can tell them what's what. And then eventually, eventually, I guess they'll bring more people here. I, I, I don't know what's the ultimate goal here. Like, yes, the average person doesn't know that the ultimate goal is that the world would be full of disciples so the world would be full of Jesus. That was the plan from garden forward, before the garden. The average person thinks, I, I don't know, I guess I'm supposed to get people to church and try to sin less, I, right? I don't, so, because I don't want to burn in hell. Like, in fact, I should probably tell people about hell a lot, you know? I mean, I could go right now, seriously, we could go out right now to a pub at lunch, and I'll, I'll put money on the table. I'll talk to at least five people and pray in the sinner's prayer because they're not going to want to burn in hell. Is that the ultimate goal? Or is it that they would be full of the Spirit of God and they would live out the purpose that God created them for? Do people know that making disciples who make disciples is what they were saved for? They're going to need to know that. That brings implication. Wow, if that's what I was saved and created and saved for, why am I spending 99% of my time and life and resources doing that? So what they know in their head, what they believe in their head, I'm sorry, what they believe in their head. Now, what they believe in their heart is probably even more important. Like, are they believing the gospel at a heart level? Do they have peace? Are they leaning into grace? Right? Do you believe, like if we're talking about motivating people with the gospel for mission, do you believe that you must make disciples or be missional to have God's love and acceptance and approval? Because we started, we started doing that. Our people, seriously, they would hang their heads around us like, well, what's up? Well, you know, I don't think our missional community is doing very good. And subtly, they, they, they knew they, they hadn't earned our approval and they probably in their hearts weren't believing that they actually had earned they, yeah, see, we're not doing very good at earning God's approval because we're just not that missional. I'm still kind of sucked into, you know, CSI reruns and soccer and too much. I suppose I'm not pleasing God enough, you know? Do they believe the truth of the gospel? See, the legalist says, you should not and you should. That's a legalist. That's how we motivate as a legalist. You should not and you should like, you should not sin, you should do this, okay? The gospel says, you need not do that, but you need. You, you need not do that, but you need. So the legalists would say, you need to get on mission. The gospel says, well, you needn't get on mission, you're already loved in acceptance, but you need to live a life fulfilling God's purposes on mission because that's how you're going to come to know him. That's how God's going to shape and mold you more into Christ. Just sitting in a classroom is not going to get that done. So you don't need to be on mission to, to please him. You already have that in Christ. But you need to be on his mission because that's how he's going to conform you. You see? A legalist says you shouldn't steal you should work hard for what you need. The gospel says you need not steal to get what you need because you have a good father that can provide everything you need if you'll just put your trust in him. So what people believe in their heart, if they're not believing the gospel and they're believing they need to do something to earn it, man, legalism's gonna run out. You can, you can motivate for a while with a stick, but it's gonna, it's gonna wear out. People are gonna leave. We're not going to do it. And it won't be attractive to the world. Wow. I get pretty motivated with this stuff. See what I did there? I get, I get really excited and I can start to 
get loud and throw hard, as we say. I, I know it can be hard to rightly motivate people on mission. We all have these well-worn grooves, patterns, and language that we've been taught to use that ends up being more law than grace, more work harder than gospel freedom, which is what Jesus came to offer and what we get to offer. Growing in our gospel fluency and learning the language of the gospel is so key in all this and, and, and really important if we're going to learn to help motivate ourselves and others on mission. And I, I want you to be able to go deeper into this. I want to invite you to a, a, a free training webinar that, that I that I've given and that I'm giving and you can sign up for it's free and it'll take you deeper into some gospel fluency stuff if you're interested in taking this further now there'll be a second part to this message I was given I'm going to give you part two next week okay and I'll tell you more about that in a minute but if you want to get this free training go to everydaydisciple.com forward slash motivation everydaydisciple.com forward slash motivation and you can sign up at a time that's convenient and uh, we'll give you that training on gospel fluency and how the gospel speaks into all of life and changes our motivations. Well, let's get to the big three for today. This is always the sort of summary three things you don't want to miss. They kind of follow head, heart, hands. And if you want a printable PDF of this week's big three as a free download, you can get that. Just go to everydaydisciple.com forward slash big three, and we'll send that right over to you. Here are the big three for this week. First, what you love will determine your true motivations in life. What we believe in our heads, so our knowledge and past learnings, that informs what we believe in our hearts. And so does our overall understanding of the gospel and our true identity. We really are a family of missionary servants now sent as disciples who make disciples. Do we believe that? Are we motivated by that truth? Gospel motivation starts with believing this is true of us because of Christ. Number two, what might you be missing because of a lack of gospel motivation? Jesus said, truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing and they will do even greater things than these. He said that in John 14. So what are the greater things God is wanting to do in your heart, in your life, in your family, your community, and church? I know he's got something. I know he does. You are perfectly loved by the Father. You've got nothing to fear. Embrace this. Ask God to start to change the motivations and desires of your life. You can trust him. And here's number three. What do you love the most? Your life, your career, your leisure, your family, your location where you live? All these good things from God may be keeping you from the life and mission God's actually called you to. That's He didn't give them to us so we'd hide behind them or spend all of our time just enjoying them. We've been blessed to be a blessing. Don't wait for someday or when we're finished with this to let the gospel change your affection, your motivation, and maybe even sometimes your location. Living God's life and plan with God's power, the Holy Spirit, will never lack. He always provides for that which he calls us to, and it will be a blast. It will be powerful and a thrill ride, I promise you. All right, well, that's the big three. Here's our new segment called Something to Think About, where I Take something that's kind of always been said or thought a certain way within our Christianity, or at least for a lot of us, and I give us something to think about. So here's today's something to think about. Why do Christians say that they believe in and take the Ten Commandments seriously, and as part of the law, God's law, it is, but then so often we treat certain of the Ten Commandments as a suggestion? See, I don't know anybody who would say, okay, here's one of the Ten Commandments, thou shalt not kill, not murder. Okay. Uh, yeah. Well, that's, I'm not doing that. Or thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife or sleep with anyone other than your own spouse. We take those as laws, but then when it comes to keep the Sabbath or keep God above everything else, that's the first commandment or keep the Sabbath rest. Why do we take those as suggestions? I'm being honest, I I have so many things in my life that I probably daily don't even realize necessarily that I'm putting above God, my preference, my fear, things I want to do, my calendar. I try to control my life. I'm not putting God first, and I don't rest well oftentimes. 
I, I, I'm not great at this. Why, why am I taking some of these commandments as suggestions? No one would ever say, oh yeah, thou shalt not murder. Yeah, gonna, I'm going to cut down on that this year. Whew, well, I don't know. This COVID thing really threw me off. 2022, that's when I'm going to cut down on murdering and sleeping with my neighbor. Oh, what? No, we wouldn't. Well, maybe this is something to think about. Do we believe what God says, all of it? Or do we take some of what he tells us as just merely suggestions? Hmm. All right. I want to invite you to join me next week. We're going to get into part two of my talk on gospel motivation. You're not going to want to miss that. I'm going to go deep into Jesus' surprising commands to his potential disciples. That, that might throw you for a bit of a loop, but he said it. How we are all full-time paid missionaries, regardless of where we work. That's an identity thing. I'm going to give you three crucial things. You absolutely cannot make a mature disciple without these three things. And we're also going to talk about where the power to live out of a gospel motivation comes from. It's not just from trying hard. You don't want to miss that. I can't wait. I'll talk to you soon. Thanks for joining us today. For more information on this show and to get loads of free discipleship resources, visit everydaydisciple.com. And remember, you really can live with the spiritual freedom and relational peace that Jesus promised every day. 